<laughs> but he, uh, he failed. I put up a few pounds too, but you're all black. You're all black. Anyway, um, yeah, John has, John did a brilliant job before this. I produced a, a film about the journey of John Coltrane, who's kind of the Elvis Presley of jazz. We got Denzel Washington to narrate it. President Clinton showed up together with Carmen and Santana. John knocked it out of the park. This time, I think I had fabulous partner that was financed by music company and that was great this is the real music company they want on tv vh1 cbs showtime paramount paramount plus and we're very proud this is the right venue to bring this to the world i think john was the right director so john in the process of doing this what did you learn about elvis that the public doesn't know that much and you didn't know but by your journey through making this what, what, what did you glean together with Dave and Pete? That's a great question. Thank you. Well, that's um, Judy's question. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Um, one of the challenges in making a, a documentary when you're dealing with a subject is to be able to peel back the layers of the onion and reveal him in some interesting way to the audience that's going to watch this. And with Elvis, uh, the challenge we had was everybody kind of thinks of, of, of fat Las Vegas Elvis. And you forget what a great artist he was and what a great impact he had on this country and on the music business. And so that's why we had our moments of, of context to show you what was going on in the 50s and, and the 60s. Bless Spencer. He sits there and he has to hear my crazy ideas. All right, so we're going to have Donovan singing Season of the Witch against Vietnam footage. And we're going to have Creedence Clearwater singing against Bobby Kennedy getting killed. He must have thought I was nuts. but. The good thing about Spencer is he, he supports his directors and he says, I don't quite understand it, but go ahead and here it is. And so as a director, you, you love that. Uh, but you also love a subject that is infinitely complex. And Elvis was a complex person. And I think one of the things we really learned on this is just how complex he was. He wasn't just a dumb cracker from, from that part of the country. There was a lot more to him. There was a thinking person there. There was an emotional person there. And I think the story that really illustrates that the best is the one that, that Steve talks about where um, Elvis says, where do you think my career is? He says, I think it's in the toilet. <laughs> now, uh, we've probably all had some contact somewhere with somebody in show business or somebody at the top of their field. And they would have just said, you're an asshole, you know, goodbye. And the fact that Elvis sat there and said, you know something, now finally somebody is speaking some truth to me. That told me a lot about him as a person, that he knew who he was, he knew the image he projected, and yet he had the wherewithal to realize really where things were and to be open to what Steve told him. Yeah, absolutely. And another thing that I'm sure you heard in the film was that 90% of every idea that Steve came up with not caring about anything but the rules that he felt in his heart, or Elvis went along with it all for two reasons. One, they were the right decisions, and two, Elvis was really a nice person. He was a smart guy, he was a thoughtful guy. He just had nobody quarterbacking his team. It was Team Elvis, but Colonel Parker was driving the bus and quarterbacking it the wrong, the wrong way. And I think like, Mom, by the way, I'm sorry to, uh, not have done this before I brought John up. Mafio has come in, who did the fantastic salsa version, all in Spanish. Mafio's here with his dad. I'd like you to stand up, Mafio. Growing up in the Dominican Republic, as you have, living in a house with six families, and feeling Elvis as a child growing up and bringing it forward to your, your in your 30s, bringing it forward to the next gen around the world in 20 Latin countries that uh, Paramount and MTV International go to. I think it's very important to bring your demo to see the film that John made. And it'll be translated in multiple languages. You don't speak English. But I think that for your work, John, I, I, I don't want to just keep praising you. I want to really praise Steve Bender because this is not a film about Elvis. This is about 
it, it, it is Elvis to, to Steve Wentz, because he was there. I wasn't there. I actually auditioned for Steve. When I met him, I was a kid, he blew me off. But I, thought, <laughs> I actually thought Steve was a great human being. And to get to know him as I have since 1968, one of the most important people, influential mentors to me, and I'm very, very, very proud to have done this. But I hope that all of you got out of seeing this, what we got out of making it. Because I think John got goosebumps every day he worked on it. Pete Lynch, the editor, there were how many cuts that we went through. Nothing but cooperativeness, nothing but sharing a vision. We wanted Steve to do a little shout out to everybody because he couldn't come. John gets in his car every day party and they drive up an hour just to make sure that it was captured properly. So I'm very proud of all of that thing. I really hope, we've, we've never played this to our audience before, but it really moves me and I would expect it to move anybody else who sees it. I would also like to thank you for laughing in all the right places. <laughs> we sit in a dark editing room for months at a time and you never really know how people are gonna to respond to something. And to hear the laugh kind of ripple through when, when Steve you know, was going down the hallway, it was, it was, it was, it was great. Uh, and one of the things I think that's important to me as a filmmaker is a lot of times when people talk about documentary, they think it's, it's got to be very serious, very thoughtful, and that's what documentaries are. I mean, the first one I ever saw was in high school, and it was about the mating habits of the tsetse fly in the South Pacific. <laughs> and there's more to it than that. And, and one of the best compliments I had, uh, I had a film come out in, in theaters in the spring called What the Hell Happened to Blood, Sweat, and Tears, and I was doing a and a like this after it. And this one guy gets up, it wasn't even a question. He just sort of got up and said, do you want to know what the difference is between you and Ken Burns? Oh. Ken is a great filmmaker. It's like, actually I would, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. He said, you have a sense of humor, he doesn't. Oh. And it was like, that's really interesting. And if you think about it, um, his are very smart, very thoughtful, but very serious and intense, as they should be. We have a story like this, and it just was so important that we not just give you the facts, that we not just give you a sense of who did what, uh, and, and how great Steve was in this process, but we also want to make you feel emotionally. We want you to feel about Elvis, we want you to feel about Steve, we want you to feel about the Colonel, all of that. And there are moments we want you to laugh because you need a little release from the, the drama of what's going on backstage, and so that was very important to us. John has truly helped my whole vision and the hope to not use the word documentary. It is a word of art we have to use because it's factual. And fortunately, unfortunately, during the strike, we don't have to have it that scripted. It has to be based on fact and reality. But it still can be dramatic. There still can be a narrative. There still can be character development, humanity. And that's what I think you brought out in this film. You did that at Coltrane, and that's something that I think in our company we strive to do is to tell stories and how things related back then, today, and tomorrow. Mafia has helped us. We use some current talent to do that musically. I come from the music world. But I do think, John, you're right. You need to laugh. You need to feel. You need to be proud of having an experience. You want to go see a Wikipedia thing. You want to go see a normal doc. 90% of what's out there today is that. But I think we're doing something very special there. You did that for Sergio, you, you did that, you tell stories. And so with that, Doug, you've got a microphone. Okay, anybody have any questions? Clearly, John will answer them all. Thank you. I discovered uh, Roy Hamilton. And you know, I've kind of researched and looked into this that uh, he was his Elvis Presley's mentor and inspiration for like five years, and Presley took a lot of his singing style from him. I was wondering if you know anything about him. You know, the biopic, he's, he's like left out, but he was this incredible, you know, black man at that time. He was even a heavyweight professional boxer at night. And uh, is there anything you can say from your experience about why he, seems to not even be mentioned? Well, now, well, he's not mentioned because he's not relevant to the making of the 68 special. He is truly, if Baz Luhrmann was sitting here and you asked him a question, that's a valid question, because Elvis had his roots in gospel. He had his roots in black. 
Handoff was done by Big Mama Thornton, written by my friend you know, Lieber Stoller. Ten years before Elvis even sang it, Roy Hamilton, absolutely, he's on an epic reference. He was a big influence on Elvis, not relevant to this special. So I'm sorry to challenge. Well, you brought him up because it's right, but it's not the context of what we did here. We telescoped a period, a six-month period, where Elvis's career was going here. You saw the contrast in the movie. The clam bake was being made at the same time Paul Newman was Luke and Cool Hand Luke. That's relevant because it showed the state of our country. That's why you showed the turmoil in 1968 and how Elvis actually had hope in his heart. He was touched by Kennedy, uh, Bobby Kennedy's assassination by Martin Luther King. None of that had anything to do with Elvis's style. Elvis built his style based on who he was. The special allowed him to showcase it. Uh, but it's an interesting question because it raises a, um, a distinction between a feature film and a documentary. I'm kind of with Spencer in a way. I, I wish we would call this something else, but documentary is really what it is. And when you saw Baz Luhrmann's film, beautifully made film, unbelievable filmmaking. Uh, uh, Spencer uh, was kind enough to invite us to a screening at uh, Warner Brothers before the film came out. We saw it. And I kept leaning over to my wife, Karen, who was here, and I said, well, that didn't happen. Well, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. <laughs> and even the coverage of the, the comeback special there, largely, it, it wasn't how it happened. And I think it's the difference between a feature film and a documentary. Feature film, you can take artistic license and brilliant artistic license and make a film that gives you the feel and the texture and the colors, but you can make dramatic points with events that didn't happen. With a documentary, we uh, must be confined to the truth. And so what you saw here tonight, everything in there absolutely happened as you saw and heard it, and that was really what our task is. You can hear Roy in everything that Elvis does. There's just that great style. Um, it just, it wasn't really on story for us, and that's why he didn't appear here. Why he didn't appear in the future film, I, I can't really answer that. Much better articulated than my response. Thank you. <laughs> One of the um, really emotional parts of this film was seeing those two young ladies who were in the audience next to Elvis. And I know in the Blood, Sweat, and Tears film, you also had witnesses that had been at this singular event 50 years before. So 50 years for this, 50 years. How did you track down those people? And it was such the unemotional point, high point of the story. Tell us about that journey. One of the things I love about my job, and there are many things, I mean, I get to go interesting places and talk to interesting people about interesting things. That's the great job. Uh, but what I really love is the detective work. We have to find stuff or find people. And in this case, it's one thing if, if uh, Steve Binder says, you know, the audience loved Elvis, or the audience there that night, they just were, it's one thing if he says it, but it's an entirely different thing if somebody who was actually in the room that night says it. And so we set uh, our detective work going, and we put out through social media uh, all kinds of, um, if you were there, please contact us, blah, blah, blah. And we had uh, several people contact us, including the two women that actually made the film. There were a few more that didn't. Um, and it's just, you can see, here it is, it's 50 years later. If you look in their eyes, next time you see the film, look in their eyes, you will see they are back in that room in 1968, and they're absolutely enthralled by their idol, Elvis Presley, singing. And that kind of uh, emotion and that kind of excitement is, again, what helps add emotion to our film. And it wouldn't have been the same if it was just Steve saying, hey, you know, people really love it. And unquestionably correct, you couldn't make up a lot of the truth that happened here when Colonel Parker said to Steve, oh, you finally you want to do this in the round? Fine, give me all the tickets. What happened, we didn't reveal this, he took the tickets and he dumped them. He trashed them all. And when Steve was ready to shoot it, there was nobody in the audience, or nobody ostensibly coming. They had two hours. So they did a promotion, the KCA radio, which was leading pop station. Three tickets come on, they went down to Bob's Big Boy which is down in Burbank, down in Washington, D.C. And to their you know, entrepreneurial zeal, 
they got enough people there and secretaries and assistants, and it happened. But you couldn't pay anybody to react the way that they reacted naturally. And for John's researchers to have found them, for them to speak, you couldn't write that in a dramatic uh, narrative at all. It happened. And that's the beauty of documentary filmmaking or cinematic elements of documentary filmmaking. But that could have been scripted, but it wasn't. It, it happened. Right? Okay. Good question. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I just, uh, you may have partially answered this already, but when I see documentary, and there may be a lot of stuff I knew already, and then I'll see this one scene, and I'll say, where did they get that from? When you were making that, whether it was an interview or a photograph or some scene, what was the one which kind of blew you away? That's a great question. I would have to say there were two things. One is the one that we did talk about before, where Steve is so brutally honest with his star, and the star takes it and learns from it, and everything that follows afterward was based on that. So I thought that was, oh wow, that's really kind of interesting. Um, I think the other one, that's really an interesting question. Um, very smart. Um, the other one, I think, is also a Steve thing, um, talking about when he saw Elvis for the last time. I hadn't heard that story. And when he talks about how Elvis slipped in the piece of paper with the number and then he couldn't reach him, I think we all felt Steve's pain, that here was a man that he had established some kind of relationship with and this was not going to continue. Um, but you could also then see the tragedy of Elvis, that he relied and was dependent so much on the colonel that even against his best interest, he would follow the colonel. And I think that was kind of an interesting moment for me as well. I can, John, I can speak to that because I do know that story a little bit. When Elvis slipped Steve the phone number, there was a guy named Jerry Schilling who was funny enough with the Frederick Schillers who called Steve the other night. I'll tell you all about it in person, real time. Um, Jerry and two others were told by Elvis that Steve has the private number. They went back to Colonel Parker. They were part of the posse. Parker made that number go away. Parker then blacklisted Steve in Vegas. Steve could never go to Las Vegas because he was so threatened by Steve. And that's why Alana's comment, Alana Nash, said, if Elvis had leaned a little more and stayed in touch with Steve, maybe he wouldn't have died, he wouldn't have gained the weight, he wouldn't have fed a lot of take all those drugs he would kill. I think that Colonel Parker was a devious prick, excuse me. And what he did is he tore up that, or he didn't tear up, he had that number disconnected to blockade Steve, to stop him. And that is interesting for you to think of uh, you know, as, as an interesting moment, but that's really the truth. And I think the Elvis story is really a tragedy because I grew to like him a lot when I saw your film because you brought a humanity out in him that the public, I don't think, has seen. You see all these stereotypical things, superstar, rock star, you know, turning on all the young girls. But he's really a good guy. And Steve speaks to me, I'm very close to Steve, and to this day he has told me Elvis was really a mesh, a really good guy who got manipulated a little bit because Parker was the father figure. His dad was a drunk Vernon, and Parker kind of played on that and took the place of Vernon. You pointed that out as well. When so, Spencer first brought me the idea about doing uh, a documentary about the comeback special, I said to him, you know, we all think of Elvis. Uh, I said before, fat Vegas Elvis, but I had just seen our local TV station, uh, um, independent station, um, it was on uh, Elvis's birthday, and the weatherman, Mark Christie, Channel 5, comes out in the jumpsuit with the sideburns and the big hair going, hey, you know, all the, the Elvisisms from Vegas. And I thought, that's what he's been reduced to. He's a joke. And the exciting thing when Spencer 
that gave me the opportunity to do this is that we did get a chance to humanize Eric and to show a whole different side of him and a whole different experience that, that had a significant impact in his life. And I think that's what kind of makes us different from any of the other uh, eldest dogs out there. Yeah. Um, I have a question about Colonel Parker. Uh, I can understand why he let him uh, control him for the first part of his life. But why did it go on for so long? Well, that's a great question. I think it is the tragedy of Elvis, as uh, Lana says it in the film. Uh, Elvis, when it came to confrontations, was missing a backbone. He didn't want to have a confrontation with anybody. But I think more than that, um, what we learned a little bit from some of our experts in the film is that um, they grew up dirt poor. And now he's having all this success. He's famous, he's making millions of dollars, he's a movie star around the world. And I think the colonel was able to manipulate him and say, you get rid of me, all that goes away. You're not gonna have that anymore. And he didn't want that to go away. And I think he was not strong enough to deal with that. Completely agree. So one thing that I've always noticed about your films, John, is that music and history are always beautifully interwoven together. And one of the things that affected me working with you is Season of the Witch and all of the graphics that were going with it, the graphic nature of it. Talk a little bit about how music plays a big role and when you're telling a story and how the, in the background, in the back of your mind, you're creating the music that goes along with it. Thank you so much for noticing. Um, I would love it if all of you would watch this film again when it's on Paramount Plus. And when you do, or when it's in the theaters uh, on July 30th, and when you do, pay attention, please, to the songs that Elvis sings and the words that he is singing. It's not just arbitrary. We didn't just put a song in there so you could see it. The, the lyrics are commenting either on something we just heard or something he's thinking or feeling at a particular time or what we're just about to hear. And so we use the lyrics very creatively. So that's kind of how we use the music. But you do see it in, in the films I make that nothing happens in a vacuum. Elvis Presley, yes, his career was nowhere. Yes, he did the special for NBC. But everything else that was going on at the time made uh, an impact on this. The fact that there were all, all of this progressive stuff going on in the 60s and the Beatles arriving that all contributed to making Elvis irrelevant. And so that was an important part of our story. We had to show why it was necessary for him to make a comeback. But also, um, it was just really important to understand what was going on in 1968. The thing that always struck me as so fascinating was that this was the top rated TV show of the year. Of the year! Every popular TV series that was going at the time, Bonanza, you name it, every great show. And Elvis beat them all. And why was that? And I think Doug Brinkley, who is one of the great historians, you've seen him on CNN all the time talking about presidential politics and things. And when Doug makes that um, analogy between um, America needed some array of hope in, in 68, and the moon, the, the moon landing, that the moon and Elvis are now the hopes of America, you can't get more eloquent than that. Speaking about a moment, that was a moment I'm sitting there when Doug says that, and it's like, whoa, that's in the film. <laughs> that was really great. So context, context, context. Spencer said something to me really early on, which was a challenge, and, 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 I, and I took it in the best possible way, which is he, he said, you know, all this footage is out there, all this comeback footage, you've seen it, it's all out there. What's gonna make this different? And what makes it different is context, to understand what people were thinking or feeling, what was going on all around the, the participants here, that's what made it so different. So we positioned all the clips in a way that gives them an entirely different meaning than if you just saw them on YouTube or, or you, you have the, the DVD or the Blu-ray. Your question was fantastic also, in that we're believers that music decorates drama. And to the best stage, going all the way back to early, you know, early musicals, you sometimes use the lyrics to a song 
and the mood of the song to perpetuate the action. Sometimes you don't need actors on the stage to break out in song. You just need the song to kind of propel what the drama would have been and you get that in the lyric and the mood. So Season of the Witch, the Creedence Clearwater song, that spoke to the period, the way that with Coppola did Apocalypse Now, and you've heard all the Motown songs. If you listen to the lyrics, they weren't randomly just thrown in there. They spoke to the feeling of the soldier. Here, Season of the Witch, I think the selections were absolutely decorating what John had in mind visually. So it wasn't just randomly blown a song. I've supervised over 100 films, and part of the magic of music supervision is decorating what you see visually with music. I think it's really important. I think John, as a filmmaker, really takes that to heart. Very sometimes filmmakers don't do that. Martin Scorsese does a great job in his movie movies, but there are many documentary, documentary filmmakers, many feature filmmakers, who just throw music up against the wall. And I think your point is well taken, that you recognize Season of the Witch was the big one. It was important for John, it was important for me, all the way to, to the point where I spoke to Donovan Leach in Ireland to make sure that he got it, and he helped us a lot, because it was like the man, the record organization, music organization, one of the big labels, it was all about the money. And to us, it wasn't about, I'm very community, as you know. Um, <laughs> To me, it wasn't about the money. It was about decorating John's footage properly. There were songs. I heard James Brothers, Time Is Gonna Come. That could have worked. That was in there. There were some songs of Joni Mitchell's. That could have worked. But Season of the Witch against the footage, the pentameter, the mood, that was nailed. And we fought to get that, and we got it. Um, one, of the, one of the things that happens a lot when you do a documentary is people get greedy. Yeah. No, so we, we reached out to, to Sony Music, which owns the master recording of, of uh, Season of the Witch. And they honestly didn't care. They didn't care how we were going to use it. They didn't care anything about it. They didn't even care that Donovan's manager had written uh, a letter to us that we could present to Sony to say, I am fine with them using that. They didn't care. They wanted $15,000 for 60 seconds of this thing. So we went to Spencer and we said, okay, we need the, the heavy hand now. Please go get this for us. And he did. He and Steve both combined and got the Donovan to just say, no, I want them to use it. Because Donovan is an artist. If you listen to his work, he was the Bob Dylan of Europe during his day. And he got it. I got the opportunity to speak to him. I spoke from artist to artist because I come from creative. He got it instantly. And I think it was within 48 hours that 15,000 went to 1,500. <laughs> calls were made. <laughs> Arms yeah. were twisted. Calls were made without people losing their jobs. <laughs> Congratulations. That was so fun. Um, just a quick question. It must be hours and hours of interviews and um, just in the edit room. How do you decide what makes it in the final cut? What, what stands out? that makes sense, but there must be hours of footage that you wish that you could use. Well, I used to be 6'2", 250. Now <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. Now, you to me, but some home, 225. <laughs> no, I mean, it really is an excellent question. Um, I think the answer is, is that uh, I look very much at a documentary as a jigsaw puzzle. And if you think about when you were a kid and you opened up the box and you dumped out a thousand pieces and eventually you fit them together and they form a pretty picture. But those pieces only fit together one way. What we do as documentary filmmakers, taking interviews, music, photographs, um, film, video, all those things, you could fit these together 10 ways, 20 ways, 50 ways, 100 ways. It's how you fit them together that makes the film good, bad, or ugly. So if you come out of the movie theater, you say, boy, that really was great. They put the pieces together well. If you come out and say, boy, that really sucked. They didn't put the pieces together so well. And so this is what we spend so many months doing. So when Spencer called and said, I got the money, we're ready to start, it was about 15 months. And a lot of that is, uh, we had some COVID issues. We probably could have taken less, but there were people that weren't comfortable doing interviews. And sometimes we couldn't travel because of COVID. 
Uh, but eventually we got everybody. And so it's about 15 months, and a lot of it is involved with making those decisions of how to fit the pieces together. You know, and sometimes we have disagreements, um, but largely we were all on the same page here. That, um, you know, it's really interesting. When I, when I start a film, I, I do a treatment. And that's what we had here to start with. And my feeling is, if, you're, if you deliver what you say you will, you're not gonna have any creative issues. And that treatment is, is like 98% of, of what we did. And so that's what it is. It's a lot of time sitting in an editing room and, and figuring out, all right, how the heck am I gonna fit these pieces together? Yeah, it's almost like the analogy to me, it's like building a house. You get a blueprint, you get an architect, you draw up your plans, you start to build. Okay, well now we'll move the plumbing here, we'll do this here, but you need to at least have the architect, you need the blueprint, and that's what John Sock does. The three uh, films that I've made with John, he's done a great job of laying out the outline and the blueprint, and we're doing one now, the next project we're gonna do, is with the, the Andrew Lloyd Webber of America, Stevie Ford. And he's a great ducky. He's a great composer, Pippin, God Spell, Wicked. And um, John spent some time talking to Stephen, made a brilliant outline. And we came to the conclusion when Universal was quite interested, that it's not an infomercial for Wicked. It's a journey of Stephen's life and career. He was in college when he wrote God Spell. He got in a fight with Bob Fosse when he wrote Pippin. That's very interesting. It's great to learn about the wicked, but you need to learn about his up and downs and his journey. And that's the beauty of making cinematic narrative documentaries. And the other thing that's really helpful is, is having a great team. And there are three of us who are my core group. It's uh, producer Dave Harding and my longtime editor for 23 years, Peter Lynch. And uh, good things happen when the three of us work together. Yeah. And so uh, I tell the story quite often, but but um, uh, a lot of times people think all the director does is say, okay, do this, do this, do this. And what you want is for somebody to say, uh, to, to, to take a whole different point of view so that you kind of make sure that what you're thinking is correct. So Pete and I have worked together for so long, we have an unspoken communication sometimes together, but he also has the ability. So I came into uh, editing one day and I said, okay, I got this great idea. We're gonna do this, 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 and this. And he turns around and he looks at me and he says, oh, John, you don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and he was absolutely right. And so this is part of, the, of why it takes so long, is that you really are considering every little moment in the film. There's no throwaways in this entire film. There's a reason why every photo is in there. There's a reason why every film clip is in there. There's a reason why every sound bite is in there. And then again, that's why it takes us so long. I'll, I'll, just, I'll try to be succinct. I just wanted to give three points that I took away from the film. Um, first of all, at my age, I know about Elvis Presley and Linda Gray Sun, but I know really, as, and I'm in a musical and a dancer, and I, we've done, I've done Hound Dog as a kid, but he really has been a one dimensional character. It was so beautiful. I feel like I really know him as a totally different human. Even, and, and also not knowing him, knowing him separate from, let's say, Priscilla Presley and his daughter and all of that. Knowing him and where he wanted to fit and show in his music. So there are two other points I would like to make. One, I think it's interesting how you use um, mafia because I think it's very relevant in music today. There's an issue as artists are having with owning their masters and, and the, the way maybe the music business can be this thing that they don't have their creative license. So the idea of the kernel, in some ways, even though for another reason, was kind of taking over El Elvis's life and being able to create that. I think that really speaks to me personally, is my parents were married in that time, and they're a biracial couple. So what I saw there was everything I learned listening to them, not being able to walk together for two years, Kent State riots and all of that, and snipers shooting at my father, walking with my mother, and not knowing about Elvis, because I was unborn at that time, but how that movement made me understand my place in the world, coming from that time. And I'm very thankful for it. It's beautifully done, absolutely. Thank you so much.